I'm going to introduce you to Todd, and he is going to take you through this fantastic uh, presentation that he's put together. And we'll have time uh, along the way. If you have questions, uh, you can just kind of cut in and try to uh, um, ask those questions along the way, or there should be some time at the end. And uh, I'm really excited that Todd Wallace has agreed to come talk to us. Todd is someone who is just uniquely interested and uh, talented in terms of understanding the background around the cooperative movement. And he is uh, currently also one of the team members on the CDS Consulting Co-ops C-Build team. So he does a variety of clients around the country as well. And he is also the current act president of People's Co-op in Portland, Oregon. He's been president before and was one of the folks that helped lead them through their uh, policy governance changes and uh, has just done a fantastic job in terms of the leadership with that cooperative over the years. And I'm looking forward to hearing from him tonight. And I'm just going to sit back and listen because this is great stuff for me, too. So Todd, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Art. That was a great introduction. I, I appreciate uh, that. Uh, those words. That was nice. Um, hello, Roanoke Board. Uh, greetings uh, to you from Portland, Oregon. Um, as Art said, um, I work on the Seabuild team, and I'm also really interested in cooperative history and cooperative culture. And so I really appreciate you inviting me in to talk to you a little bit today about a fascinating topic, the Rochdale pioneers and the early uh, period in the cooperative movement. Cooperative history is a vast, long thing. And so you can pick all kinds of the aspects of cooperative history and culture from Mondragon in Spain, Emilia Romagna in Italy. Uh, you could even go back prior to the 19th century if you wanted to and talk about how people cooperated uh, before the modern uh, cooperative era, as it were. But uh, tonight, we're going to focus on these important folks, the Rochdale pioneers. So thanks again for welcoming me. Um, one more thing I wanted to tell you also before we start is that this is the first time I've actually presented this on, in, uh, on the internet via e-communication. Uh, e so uh, usually I, when I do this, I do it in front of groups of people and there's more interaction and Q&A and I like to make eye contact. and so. This is a little bit different for me, uh, but uh, so if my flow is a little bit strange. That's the reason. Although the good thing is that if you get bored, you can just leave, and I won't know. Uh, and so uh, you won't hurt my feelings. But uh, hopefully you won't be bored at all, because this is really fascinating stuff. So we're going to talk today about uh, the Rochdale Pioneers, uh, this uh, thing I titled Roots of the Cooperative Movement. And let's just uh, go through what we're going to go through tonight. Uh, we're going to start with the significance of the year 1844. It's a very uh, significant time. Um, and then we're going to ask a question, who were these people, the Rochdale pioneers? Then we're going to move from that question to talk a little bit about life in northern England in the 19th century, what it was like and then key in on some of the influences of the early cooperative movement. And then I'm going to end the time uh, with some quotes and questions for you all to provoke further thought and discussion. And really, that's, that's really the important part of this, because I'm, I'm just really presenting information. What you all do with it, how you all think about it, and the conversations that come out of your uh, follow-up, that's what's really key. That's what's really important. So let's go ahead and move along to uh, talk about the Rush of Pioneers. 1844 is a key year. Uh, several things happened in 1844. I'm going to key in on three events, uh, which are highly influential in our modern thought around economics. First off, uh, in 1844, British Parliament passed the Joint Stock Act as well as the Bank Charter Act of 1844. These two laws 
uh, created the basis for A, the modern stock corporation, and uh, started on the development for the constitution of the Bank of England, a national bank. Because of these two items, the Joint Stock Act and the Bank Charter Act of 1844, it, lead, it leads us to the development of this. Actually, this is Scrooge McDuck, who uh, was a Walt Disney character uh, created in the 1940s. But I'm using this image of Scrooge McDuck actually as a metaphor or a, uh, a symbol for this concept capitalism. Uh, and so we see that in 1844 you have the beginnings uh, legally of the modern structures. Call it, you can call it capitalism, you can call it whatever you want. But basically what I think of is sort of the dominant economic paradigm today. So back to 1844, you have another event which occurs. Uh, this gentleman, who is a German-born businessman, wrote a book called The Conditions of the Working Class in England. This book got the attention of this gentleman. This gentleman, who in that same year wrote another book called The Economic and Philo Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Um, oh, there's a slight misspelling there, I apologize. Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. Um, also called the Paris Manuscripts, uh, according, uh, according to certain scholars of this gentleman's work. These two men formed a friendship. And out of their friendship came this book, The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Um, now, I want to say just a couple things about The Communist Manifesto. Uh, unlike... Scrooge McDuck, in capitalism, the Communist Manifesto, I think we would all agree, is not the dominant economic paradigm today. Um, and yet, not to sell Marx and Engels short, a lot of the ideas um, that they put forth in the Communist Manifesto in relation to how we think about uh, good ways to treat workers and labor uh, are still with us today. And so, you know, it's, it's unfair to say that the Communist Manifesto hasn't had any kind of impact in today's society, even though we would probably all agree that it's not the dominant economic paradigm. So just a, a little bit. And Marx will actually reappear in our talk a little bit later. Um, but that's the second thing or event which uh, I linked to 1844. And now the third thing, uh, which is really what we care about tonight, 28 working people founded a co-op. Um, this co-op was actually called the Rochdale Equitable Pioneer Society. Um, Rochdale, because it occurred um, in the town of Rochdale, which is in northern England. Equitable, which was a value that the cooperators held, the early cooperators, uh, equality. Pioneers, because they felt that they were on the cutting edge of something. And society. If you notice, they call themselves the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers Society, not the Rochdale Co-op, which is interesting. In fact, uh, we think that the reason why they called themselves the society was because many of them had been involved in an earlier uh, cooperative that actually had the name cooperative in the title. And it was actually on the same street as the new cooperative. And that cooperative has failed. And so there's a speculation that they actually, uh, with this new co-op, decided not to include the word cooperative in the title because of a marketing decision. They didn't want to be associated with that earlier failed enterprise. It's kind of interesting. And here they are, uh, the actual pioneers. Actually, this is 13 of them and not the full 28. Uh, and this uh, photograph was taken, I believe, somewhere in the 1860s. Uh, so about a decade and a half or so, maybe two decades after the founding of the co-op in 1844. And so at this point, uh, they're fairly established as a, as a cooperative and a business. Um, but that's one, uh, one image of them. Uh, as you can see, they're all male. Uh, they're all English. 
Uh, and they, as we'll learn, they were all trade folk as well. But who were these people, really? Well, here's another look at the pioneers. Um, this one uh, from a book uh, that I'm going to reference later. The original members of the Rochdale Equitable Pioneer Society Limited, a chart compiled by some really excellent historians and scholars. The 28 original members. If you look at this document, it's kind of interesting. You can see uh, what their occupations were. Uh, as well as their names. And you know, you look at down this list of occupations, flannel weaver, shoemaker, tailor, block printer, joiner, cabinet maker. Uh, again, they're all working folks um, from this area of northern England. Um, they, and they identify themselves uh, under the column persuasion in different ways. Chartist, congregationalist, socialist, unitarian. Uh, it's very interesting. Let's take a look at where they came from in relation to the rest of England, uh, Great Britain. So uh, Rochdale is on the little red A, just north of Manchester, uh, just east of Liverpool. Uh, you can see London uh, f much farther down south. Uh, basically, they're situated in the industrial part of England. Um, and uh, what was occurring cur at, at the time in the 1840s, of course, there was the Industrial Revolution, which, is, which, which was in full swing at this time. Uh, and the heart of industrial England was in this area, uh, around Manchester, Leeds, and Liverpool. Um, and of course, the dominant uh, sort of uh, industry was textiles. Because at the time, in the 19th century, I guess you could think of cotton being the petroleum of their age. It was really the driving force in the economy. Here's a picture of their store, uh, the Equitable Pioneer Society. This is the actual, this is the actual store uh, today, as it looks. It was uh, made into a museum. And so if you go there today, this is what you will see. Um, also, I'm going to introduce to you a quote from George Jacob Holyoke, who was uh, an early uh, pioneer uh, and a uh, historian of the Rochdale Pioneers Co-op. He said, and the humble cooperative weavers of Rochdale, by saving two pennies when they had none to spare and holding together when others separated until they had made their store pay, set an example of which created for the working classes a new future. We're going to uh, talk a little bit more about George Holyoke in a little bit, but it's an interesting quote. If you went to the store, you would be able to buy the following items. Sugar, flour, butter, oatmeal, and tallow candles. Uh, this was what they sold when they opened. Uh, as they got a little bit more successful, they added two more items to their list of things you could buy, tea and tobacco. And this is a view, a photograph from the inside of the museum. They set up a little display here, uh, kind of showing maybe what it might have looked like in 1844. So uh, you know, we tried to explore a little bit about who they were, but did, you know, what do we know? Do we know that much? Not so much, I think. We know kind of who they were, uh, you know, what they sold. Let's kind of delve a little bit more into it. Let's look at this fact. In order to make an, in, an initial investment for the original 28, what you had to do was you had to pay two weeks' wages up front and eventually a total of 10 weeks of wages. Uh, that is, in my opinion, a considerable amount of money. Imagine what... Uh, the cooperative movement today would be like in America if uh, our members had to pay 10 weeks of wages total. Imagine what kind of capital we would have. Uh, very different. And yet, as you can kind of guess, uh, these were working folks and they didn't have a lot of capital to give. So it's an interesting question why this initial upfront investment, which is actually quite, uh, quite a lot in my opinion. Why start a co-op um, at all, in fact? Considering that, as I mentioned, capital is scarce, 
And another fact of the era, uh, at this time, co the liability for co cooperative debt for this project would be unlimited for the investors, meaning that unlike today, if you're invested money, you're not just on the hook for what you've invested, but for any debt that the co-op has accumulated. That's a huge, huge risk for someone. Uh, actually, limited liability for cooperatives in England did not occur until the 1860s. And so we're uh, a couple of decades away from that. And yet, they still decided they wanted to do it. They decided it was worth it. Interesting. To figure out why they thought it was worth it, let's go back to 1844 and specifically life in the north in the 19th century in northern England, uh, which was a really fascinating and interesting time. You can see there are a lot of things going on in the 19th century in England. Change, the Industrial Revolution, community needs, a lot of stuff happening, especially around change. Well, what kind of change, you might ask? Here's a, uh, an engraving or a drawing of uh, Manchester, uh, I believe around the 1860s. Kind of change. Well, practically overnight, a rural society transformed into an industrial one. Unemployment, poverty, disease, child labor are widespread as are uprisings and revolt. For example, between 1801 and 1851, the population of Manchester grew from 85,000 to 400,000. From 1801 to 1841, the population of Rochdale grew from 14,000 to 68,000. So you can see uh, that, trans that tra transformation from rural to industrial happening quite quickly. Speaking of labor uprisings and revolt, <coughs> excuse me, here is a, a neat little engraving of uh, uh, Luddites smashing a uh, a uh, loom, a uh, steam-powered loom, I believe. Some more interesting facts. Low wages and high prices for food and housing were the norm, as was a 60-hour work week. Affordable food, difficult to find. Uh, various taxes tripled the cost of real food. When people could get real food, it was almost always adulterated with impurities. Uh, or the people selling it to them uh, were corrupt, and so you really couldn't get uh, food at a fair cost. For example, in terms of adulteration, flour would combine with plaster of Paris and bones, tea supplemented with iron fillings that would make the tea way more on the scale, so it would increase the price. Here is a neat uh, picture of uh, children, child laborers in a line get paid at the factory. Some more facts about life in this time and place. In the 1840s, around 40% 40 of all male and female deaths were children under the age of five. For women who reached the age of 25, 46% died before they reached the age of 45. Uh, of course, this led to a crisis of community. The average life expectancy of a Manchester laborer was 17. If you were a wealthy landowner, by comparison, it was 52. Democracy. Uh, well, there were some interesting uh, facts about democracy in the period. Uh, of course, the conditions were made worse by a crisis of democracy. To vote, you had to be male and a property owner. As a result, uh, in the area's 1832 election, for their member to parliament, the representative from parliament. Out of a population of 28,000 for Rochdale, only 632 votes were cast. So you see uh, quite a lot going on in North England at the time. And I think that lends, gives us a little bit more of an idea about who these people were and why they would take this enormous risk. Uh, so we talked a little bit about 
uh, them and where they came from, what, what it was like they were, where they were living. Let's talk a little bit now about some of the influences, um, apart from uh, history and economics, some of the philosophical, social, political influences that uh, they that, that influenced their uh, their movement here. I'm going to start with this gentleman, Dr. William King. Um, King was an early supporter of the cooperative movement. He started a newspaper called The Cooperator in 1828. Now, I want to talk just for a second about the significance of starting a newspaper in the 19th century. If you remember, uh, or if you read about the 19th century, uh, really the dominant uh, mode of mass communication is through the print media, um, as opposed to today where, I mean, I guess our dominant mode would be broadcast media and then also moving into uh, e-media and the internet. The 19th century, really, print was king. Uh, this was the era when uh, people would gather around and read from uh, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens or uh, pay someone to actually read for them uh, because it was a printed word that really mattered and people were hungry for the information that came through printing. So King's newspaper, The Cooperator, uh, was quite influential. It only lasted a couple of years, but it, it's known or it's mentioned by historians as being incredibly important for that early movement. Uh, one thing King had said repeatedly over and over again, workmen united together must be independent. Let them save and save and save to form a common, common capital. Let this capital be their master. And so. When I think about the pioneers and their, the importance they put on the saving of capital, that initial capital investment, that there, I'm sure there was a temptation to make the, the initial investment cheaper to encourage people to join the co-op, and yet they were, they were committed to this idea that if we're going to succeed, we need to get enough capital to do so. Uh, I still think that's a, that's a, you know, a theme that echoes into the modern era. Another thing about King, King was an Owenite, and he was involved in the first wave of cooperatives that happened before 1840. So let's go from him to the Owenites, and let's talk about who the Owenites were. Well, um, the Owenites are basically followers of a gentleman by the name of Robert Owen. Uh, Robert Owen was a highly influential human being in British history. He was a writer, a speaker, a philanthropist, a factory reformer, an educator, a social reformer, and a trade unionist. He was also a highly successful uh, manager of a cotton spinning factory, like one, of the, one of the most profitable in Europe. So he was obviously a good manager and also highly uh, involved in or highly committed to improving the life of his own workers. He had this, uh, this sort of revolutionary concept or this idea that if you provide workers with things like housing, ventilation, windows, healthy food, education, good working conditions in general, that they would be more productive, that they would actually increase your productivity. Uh, and he was right uh, in the sense that he became very successful. He was also really interested in utopian communities. Um, utopian philosophy uh, had been around uh, in Europe now for, I guess, a couple hundred years. And he was very interested in making uh, that philosophy, that utopian concept, a reality. Um, and he was committed to basically creating intentional communities that promoted equality, democracy, and in which resources and power were shared by all their citizens. Now, I think what you can draw from from you know this uh, idea and from some of the historical stuff we've been talking about, you can kind of see some of the the uh, key factors that will much much later be involved in the idea of the cooperative principles and values, basically. Um, the Owenites, like I said, the followers of Owen were heavily involved in what we call the first wave of British cooperatives in the 18, from 1830 to 1835. It's worth noticing or noting that uh, most of these first wave cooperatives failed. 
And the reason why they failed had to do with lack of adequate capitalization and things like the extending of credit to such a degree that it cannot be financially sustainable. The focus for them was more on the social reform than the financial sustainability aspect of it, being a financial business. I want to note before we leave the Owenites that this experience of that first wave failing really had an impact on the Rochdale pioneers and the cooperators, the early cooperators. They really learned from a lot of those things. Like I mentioned before, two, at least uh, two or maybe even more of the Rochdale pioneers were involved in that first wave to the tune of actually starting a co-op that failed. Uh, from Owen, now I'm going to move to the Chartists. Uh, the Chartists were a political reform movement uh, with some very similar ideas to the Owenites. Um, they were, uh, but they were heavily interested in basically extending democratic rights. Um, at this time, it, you know, in order to vote, like we talked about that crisis of democracy, you had to be male in order to vote, and you had to be uh, an owner of property, which was, uh, you know, kind of really narrowed things down to the people who could actually vote. And so the Chartists were interested in a number of things, one of which was a secret ballot, universal adult male suffrage, uh, and no property qualifications to be a member of parliament. Uh, the Chartists. Another interesting thing about the Chartists was that they had a certain style, you know, that maybe was a little bit different than the Owenites. Um, their style was really about gathering large groups of people together in spaces and making a lot of noise and carrying a lot of torches and uh, collecting uh, weapons such as par pikes and rifles. That was, you know, uh, their chosen mode of uh, of organization. And it worked for a little bit. Here's a picture of a Chartist riot. Um, I probably, I think this is from the Punch newspaper uh, in the era. And here, here's a neat quote that I love. It's from an eyewitness account, uh, supposedly of someone who saw numerous Chartist demonstrations. The, pro the processions were of immense length sometimes containing as many as 50,000 people. And along the line, there blazed a stream of light illuminating the lofty sky, the reflection of a large city in general conflagration. The meetings themselves were of a still more terrifying character. The very appearance of such a vast number of blazing torches only seemed more effectually to inflame the minds of speakers and hearers. This is one of the uh, photographs uh, from one of the later uh, meetings of the Chartists. This was at uh, Kennington Common. And uh, this was one of the last of their gatherings. Basically, uh, the Chartist movement, as, I, as you can kind of gather, was filled with a lot of kind of passion and uh, sometimes very uh, ornery or, or loud uh, dialogue, and people began to collect weapons. Um, this got really popular, and as you can imagine, began to make uh, the government quite fearful. And so what happened was that the government began to invest in spies to infiltrate the Chartist movement, began to harass many of their leaders and imprison, imprison many of them, or ship them off to Australia, and also uh, began to hire soldiers uh, to watch these rallies. This one at Kennington Common was in, I believe, in 1848 in South London. Depending on how you talk to, some people say 50,000 people showed up. Others say 100,000 people showed up. Prior to this event, the Chartists had uh, submitted uh, changes to Parliament twice, once in 1839 and again in 1842. Both times, Parliament rejected their demands. And so this was considered to be uh, one of the one of the sort of ultimatum type of uh, situations where they were they were thinking 
we're going to show up and we're going to be so big they can't ignore us. And if they do, something's going to happen. Well, as it turned out, this huge amount of people showed up for this rally at Kennington Common. And there was some, you know, people were, there was some shouting, people brought uh, weapons. But there were a lot of soldiers there watching over the group. And Parliament said, go ahead and submit your, uh, submit your charter. And we're going to vote on it. And then you're going to go home. And if not, then we're going to shoot you, basically. Uh, and they did. They submitted it. Parliament rejected it. People kind of waited around for a couple hours. And then they decided they were going to go home because they didn't want to get shot, presumably. After this event, you can probably guess, Chartism as a, uh, as a movement began to die out. They realized that uh, they weren't really making an impact, or the impact they wanted to make, anyway. Um, before we leave off from the Chartists, I wanted to mention Elizabeth Gaskell, who was uh, a novelist, uh, an important English novelist and a Chartist. Um, she wrote about the hardship and poverty of the time was a very popular speaker in Rochdale and interested in a couple of topics, Christian socialism and also this new idea about worker cooperatives. And so uh, she was an important voice for the Chartists. Um, many, although the Chartist movement did die out uh, after the, the rally at Kennington Common, again, it was a high, just like the Owenites, it was a highly influential movement to the Rochdale pioneers. In fact, if you remember that chart we saw earlier, many of them identified at the founding of the cooperative as Chartists, as committed Chartists, and, and passionate believers, at least in the ideas around Chartism. And I also want to talk about the influence of working class women in the early cooperative movement. Now, it's interesting. Um, Actually, the role of working women in the early life of the Rochdale pioneers is not as well documented as we would like. Um, this is why I wrote important yet invisible in the circle. Uh, unfortunately, of course, this was due to a number of uh, things. Male society of the era scorned activist women, although there were quite a number of activist women in Rochdale as early as, let's say, 1808. Um, there are a number of uh, activist groups that are, that are populated by women. And there are a number of women chartists, uh, specifically working class women. I mentioned Elizabeth Gaskell, the novelist, earlier. Um, and yet, she was middle class and, of course, uh, had the means to become a writer. Um, and yet, there were, there were working women that were actually really important activists as well. Um, however, we don't know that much about them unfortunately, again, because of the fact that historians of the era largely ignored the contributions that they made, unfortunately. Uh, but like I said, we do know a little bit. We do know that, there were, that they existed as activists. We know there are two names that come up, Anne Tweedale and Eliza Brearley. Uh, Anne uh, Tweedale is mentioned by uh, Holyoke as an early organizer of the co-op, a key organizer. Unfortunately, uh, Holyoke doesn't go into much detail about what she did as an organizer and what her role really was. And so, again, she's kind of a mystery to us. Um, Eliza Brearley is noted as the first woman member of Rochdale in 1846 on the books. She showed up and paid her uh, member her capital investment and got on, the, got on the books as a member. This is an era, I want to point out, in which uh, it is not legal for women to really have any kind of ownership in uh, property or a significant amount of capital, especially if you're married. If you're married, husband owns uh, your property. So uh, that's a significant thing. Um, one thing we can think about, or one thing I like to think about uh, for the role of working class women in the co-op is something uh, David Thompson talks about this in his book, Weavers of Dreams. He describes the, their lives as heavily invested in promoting the co-op by spreading the word among their friends and associates, by uh, encouraging people to shop at the co-op, by helping to organize meetings, doing things like, because uh, 
again, they're, many of them are weavers, seamstress, seamstresses, weaving uh, the actual uniforms worn by the early workers at the co-op, uh, actually creating them. Um, and doing all of this stuff while, in addition, taking care of the families and, for many of them, working full days at the factory. So, uh, you know, their role is definitely not to be uh, understated by any means. I want to show you this quote from Dr. Anna Hoyt from the University of Wisconsin. She said, to me, one of the most wonderful moments in the Rochdale Pioneer's history is that the co-op intentionally broke the law and allowed women to accumulate capital in their own right. The co-op protected the women's right to keep their capital even when their husbands demanded it. This often provided the cushion these women needed to escape dire poverty. It's interesting. Uh, the painting I'm showing you, like I said, is by Frank Hall. Uh, and it's based on a poem, The Song of the Shirt, which is a really famous poem uh, that was written by Thomas, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Hood. So the Song of the Shirt was a poem basically uh, describing uh, what it was like to be a working person, specifically a seamstress, uh, in this time period. And it's a, it's a really haunting piece, a very tragic piece, and it was very popular at about the time the, the cooperators founded uh, Rochdale. Okay, so we looked at the Owenite, we looked at the Chartists, and we looked at the role of working class women uh, really in adding to this portrait of influences for the Rochdale Pioneer. I hope you found that interesting. Um, they certainly were not the only influences, um, but I think these are some of the main ones. Uh, if, you look, if you delve deeper, you'll find that there were all kinds of intellectual, political, social movements going on in the 19th century. It was rich with this kind of stuff. So uh, if you deal more, you'll probably find that there's even more thought uh, going into what uh, these people are doing. I want to now just go, just briefly uh, go on a little tangent. Um, you see two pictures in front of you. Of course, we're back to Marx, and then we've got this uh, scene here from A Christmas Carol uh, by uh, Charles Dickens. And it's actually, if you look at it, it's a picture of Scrooge, Ebenezer Scrooge, with uh, the last of the spirits, the ghost of Christmas future. And I just, I wanted to, I like to juxtapose these two photographs, because uh, this is my idea about how I think about the cooperators, the early cooperators. Basically, if you think about Charles Dickens, he wrote a story about a wealthy industrialist who has a spiritual awakening. And after he has his awakening, kind of works to affect change. If you wanted to, you could think of that kind of change as existing uh, to create reform through institutional structures that already exist. Uh, in his case, in this case, religion, in terms of kind of uh, being woken up by a spirit of the Christmas future, but also I think you think about in terms of politics. And so change through existing institutional structures. Marx, by contrast, and Marx was a big fan of uh, Charles Dickens' writing, but I think he would be critical of the idea that you could have change through existing structures. For Marx, you remember, change could only happen through revolution, by basically tearing down in institutional structures and creating new, new ones. And so I like to think of the cooperators, and this is my idea, I like to think about them as existing kind of in between these two concepts, the idea of change through reform and change through revolution. You might think of them as agents of change in their society, not hostile to the ideas of reform within existing institutions or revolution um, of those institutions, but really interested in practical ways to affect change. That is, affecting change by the creation of new institutions that can exist within or alongside the old institutions. So without having to tear down these structures. You know, just an idea. So I'm going to give you one more shot of at least 13 of the original pioneers. And then before I leave you, uh, and we're almost done, 
I want to share with you this book by David J. Thompson, Weavers of Dreams. Uh, Art mentioned to me that he had just reread it yesterday, uh, which I think is great. Um, this is an excellent book. This is where I've got mo uh, much of my information uh, for today's lecture. Um, David Thompson is an amazing collaborator. Uh, he's based out of Davis, and I've seen him actually uh, speak in person a number of times. Uh, and he likes he loves to talk about uh, Rochdale uh, as well as other uh, cultures, cooperative cultures and, and history. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, I encourage you to do so because he's just a really engaging and fun speaker. He's actually from uh, not Rochdale, but a little town that's very close to Rochdale, and his family has is several generations of uh, cooperation. So uh, definitely check out this book if you want to learn more about this time period. I also recommend that you check out this article, if you're really interested, by Brett Fairbairn, who is a cooperative uh, theorist and economist and historian, called The Meaning of Rochdale, The Rochdale Pioneers and the Cooperative Principle. This is a really in-depth article that really, uh, Fairbairn does the great thing. He takes the story of Rochdale and he kind of deconstructs it and analyzes it, um, both as a historian and in relation to the cooperative principle that come much later. And so I encourage you to check out that article as well if you want to, uh, which is actually available online. You can actually get that for free. And now I want to leave you with a couple of quotes and then some uh, last questions. Uh, quote number one, this is a photograph now of George Jacob Holyoke, who was an early cooperator and uh, they're one of the earliest historians. He wrote a book called The History of the Rochdale Pioneers, which I believe you can probably uh, find online. And his quote is interesting, kind of inspirational. The mor moral miracle performed by our cooperators at Rochdale is that they had the good sense to differ without disagreeing, to dissent with each other without separating, to hate at times, and yet always to hold together. I love that quote. So that's one, and now I'm going to show you another quote. This one, again, by Brett Fairbairn, uh, former director of the Center for Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan. And Brett Fairbairn says, Rochdale is part myth, but no matter. The myth has its own kind of truth, and such myths and such truths are to be respected. This myth is a good one and a constructive one, and contains elements that are true by anyone's definition. Rochdale is a historical reality, an icon or totem for the world cooperative movement object of belief for millions. What does it mean? The important thing to remember is that the meaning of Rochdale is constructed by each generation to meet its own needs. Now I want to leave you with some questions that I hope that you will explore on your own. And these are just ones I, I thought up uh, as I practice going through this, this uh, lecture. Why do co-ops arise when they do? What nurtures them to develop and evolve? There is a culture and a history associated with cooperatives, cooperatives in general, and also associated with your own particular cooperative. Why is it important to record, know, study, and consider this history? What value does it add to our experience? And then finally, what will you take away from today's lecture that will provide context and meaning for your future conversations, questions, and co-op work? Probably the most important question. And I hope you do continue uh, this conversation. And so here's you with your thinking cap, kind of uh, you know, considering all the things you've learned today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. And again, thank you very much for having me.